Thank you all for joining uh, all of you on the line here and hope you've all in, enjoyed the discussion so far um, about how Question Pro is leading uh, the charge in advancing research. And uh, again, a treat for me today because I get to have a conversation with Mark. And every time he and I talk, I learn something new. Um, it's certainly uh, been a unique year um, where, you know, we're, we're, we're going to try and combine our 50 plus years. I mean, think about that 50 plus years of CX experience between the two of us to half a century longer than I think customer satisfaction research has existed just about. <laughs> um, but we'll bring you some insights. Um, and, um, you know, both in how customers will be served um, and how CX research is going to have to be adjusted moving forward. And uh, of course, we have a, a great announcement that we're going to tease right now. Um, but first, Mark, welcome to the conversation. Glad you're here. I'll let you uh, give yourself a, another minute to introduce yourself. Sure. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been enjoying uh, the activities of the day on next day here with Question Pro. And uh, really, uh, just uh, any kind of questions you may have about CX research this would be a great time to bring it up if you do have a question please put it in the q a uh and that way we'll be able to sort through it and find it quickly um ken what's your thoughts yeah. well i think um you know it, it's hard to stay away from the pandemic um and uh we, we we wouldn't be doing it justice if we didn't bring it up i know Vivek brought it up this morning even i mean you can't it's the elephant in the room uh so I, uh, I was going to start off with talking about, uh, I remembered New Year's Eve 2019 um, very distinctly. Um, I have, had been taking some time off. Vivek was bothering me to come join him. I think I talked to him about three days before that. And he's like, come join me here at Question Pro. And I'm thinking 2020 is going to be a fun year for me. Um, and little did I know the journey that we would all be taking. Um, particularly when it comes to providing service to customers. I, I teased it before in our q and or talking about uh, the travel things that I've been doing. And uh, certainly COVID has just uh, caused businesses to change their approach. As I'm sitting here, I'm in a conference room and I look out where the elevators are, there's a hand sanitizing station there. I mean, how often did you really think uh, that you would see that in every business that you go to? <laughs> I mean, prior to this. So, I mean, businesses have changed their approach. Cleanliness is um, not only more carefully scrutinized by customers, but communication uh, about cleanliness is important. I think I've been, I, I'm, I'm sort of a, a, a research junkie, as you know. I've actually tracked every email that I've gotten about COVID-19 and the cleanliness. And I think I'm well up over uh, about 2,000 at this point. Wow. Every customer, everything. So, um, and then I mentioned travel. I mean, my first travel experience uh, after this all broke out, and as I mentioned, I've actually almost 50,000 miles later in just a few months while everyone was hunkering down. But that first travel experience, I was mo we're moving across an ocean. Um, my son and I, uh, they had just canceled school for the rest of the year, and we said, we weren't gonna move till June, but we said, my wife is already down there in Hawaii. Let's get on the plane. Let's." leave Colorado behind, we can't ski anyway. So we hopped on a, a plane and what was unique was it was an empty airplane. I have been on empty airplanes before and it's often you know flying between Bozeman and Fargo, North Dakota or something like that. This was a plane from Denver to Hawaii that had 11 passengers. Um, San Francisco airport, completely empty. Um, 50 people maybe I could count in the entire airport at the time. Um, that is just a far cry from what I experienced before. And then things like, you know, renting a house, you couldn't see a house before you rented it, things like that. This whole thing has changed uh, completely. So I was going to ask you, what are the, you know, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in customer service, good and bad? I mean, what do you think is going to stick around long term? Well, I think that we're, we're definitely going to have the safety uh, things in, in place uh, along the different touch points. Um, and there's a lot more move towards, um, of course, uh, whatever's happening in the physical world is, is, is great, 
And I think a lot of those things will stay. Uh, in Georgia here, ha most of the people don't even wear masks. I mean, it's a crazy kind of thing to have to deal with on a local basis. But what I see happening more than anything is just a huge shift towards online delivery and, and ordering. Um, you know, to see the kinds of, of things that they're able to do now, anything from food to a car to, <laughs> to, to, you know, whatever you want off Amazon, you can get pretty quickly. Um, and I think that that's prompted more people to do that. The other thing is, I mean, just look what we're doing here. Um, you know, how many of us did a bunch of Zoom, who even knew Zoom last year this time? You know, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how Thank we humans and as people are coming together to sort of, you know, find ways to still work together. And, uh, you know, you, you got to go out in the physical world to get things sometimes. Um, here, you know, I, I play music too. And so we're actually doing pods of areas where people are, are, are cordoned off for our concerts. And, and that's actually working pretty good. Um, you know, they give them a, like a, you know, roped off area or, or chained off area and that way they can stand there. Um, but I think what's really important here, uh, Ken, is how can we talk to these people? How can we talk to customers, to patients, to, to, the, to the users and the shoppers? How can we get them to tell us you know, things about the future um, and things about their experience? So, uh, you know, I tend to break this stuff down pretty simply between uh, the research that shows metrics of what happened is one side of the coin. It tells you it's a rear view mirror. It's an insurance policy. It tells you, how am I doing? And that's it. <laughs> how am I doing? Uh, and that could be anything from a NPS to a CES customer effort score to CSAT. Okay, any of those scores, even thumbs up, thumbs down. Vivek did a great um, survey for us. He, he recommended this uh, survey for uh, CX Talks years ago, and it's become a, a real easy, fun thing for me to do. And that was a, a uh, a simple thumbs up, thumbs down in an email. Vivek, you want to uh, share some of your thoughts on that? How you came up with it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that we did when I talked to CX, when I talked to you know Mark earlier on, was like right after a conference, we wanted to get some feedback. And Mark said like, look, I, I don't want detailed kind of analysis. What I want to know was, was it good? Was it bad? And where should I focus my attention on? What should I fix? So really three questions, good, bad, where to focus the positives, where to fix the negatives. That's kind of what, what he wanted to kind of really achieve. And, uh, and you know, frankly, what we said was like, look, you know, at the, end of a, at the end of the conference, send out a simple email with the inline thumbs up, thumbs down in it, in the, you know, in the, in the survey itself, in the, in the email itself. Um, instead of clicking, clicking on a link, you kind of like, you know, just click on two, two icons within the survey, you know, and that itself records the, records the, the, the signal, if you will. Um, and then a simple question after that, like, hey, what can we do better? Um, and then vote on each other's ideas. I strongly believe in crowdsourcing. I strongly believe in that kind of model around like engaging your customers with you in terms of in your journey as a, as an event producer, as a, you know, as a SaaS platform uh, from our perspective. So. Um, and that works really well. We had like upwards of, you know, 70%, 65, 70% kind of, you know, response rates and great, great input. Um, so that's kind of like, I mean, again, we looked at the model um, and then the, the, the circumstance and we kind of said like, how do we make this dead, brain dead simple and brain dead, you know, easy to use. So that's all we did. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I think simplicity and making it so easy for people to do is key. Um, you know, the only complaint I got on that survey, by the way, out of all the times that we did it, uh, the only time I got one complaint from someone says, I need to have a middle. So I need to have a, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to take a position, yes or no. It's kind of like, you know, undecided voter, I guess. But, um, you know, that was the only complaint I got is, I'm in the middle and you didn't have a place for me. You forced me to go one way or the other. It's Biden or Trump, Trump, man. Come on, there's no middle. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> To choose a side. <laughs> Tell us why. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The thumbs up. Always vote third party. Or well, I, vote away. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you see these, you see these, uh, you know, physical products in, in a lot of places, and I tell you, the the yet, you know, the smiley faces. Yes, no. There's like four of them, right? And th that's forcing a position too, but it's somewhat or you know, very right. But why put them at the exit of a restroom? God help me, I don't know. Have you ever seen that in airports? 
How was your yeah. experience today? God, <laughs> I can't. But, and it's right in yeah. LaGuardia. It's right after you wash your hands. They want you to push the button and say how the bathroom experience was. Well, like, the, the key is that's fantastic. If it goes to someone who can clean the bathroom right then, right? But if it's just to know how we're doing and it's aggregated at the end of the month, I mean, that's not very helpful. So the point is today, people expect responses from their complaints immediately. And, and getting that information to the people who can actually make those changes quickly is key. Uh, yeah, I remember we, we did mystery shopping for years and years. I mean, you know, 20 something years of mystery shopping, about 5,000 shops a month. And we did it with paper. And, and some buckets of mail coming in and, and, and our clients were accustomed to getting information from their mystery shop monthly at the end of the month. Now they get it 24 hours after the shop, they get the report sent to the manager, they can share it with their staff, et cetera. So speed of delivery and attention is also affected greatly by this uh, pandemic. We're all sitting at home, we can order it from Amazon, get it here in an hour. <laughs> We can get online and do this kind of stuff at very little cost. So, so you know, what are other ways to engage people when they may not want to be engaged? You know, such as shopping at Kroger or you know, and masks and, and all that regalia. They're busy. They're doing their thing. You know, that's that's real key. Is how do we get the actual transactional information? And I'm a junkie, as like you can. I sit there and fill out these surveys all the time. But again, I like free chicken and points at Kroger and stuff like that. So, but I'll fill it out pretty close to the time I'm there. I am always curious, what are they doing with it? Well, and and I've you know I, I'm a huge advocate of closed loop feedback, and I'll, I'll say one thing that I've noticed in the last six months. I'll say we have quite a few people that would run a. I'll just call it a customer satisfaction study using the the research tool using surveys uh, no closed loop feedback no distributed reports they'll download all the data and make the reports that they want to make to present and all that but i've certainly noticed a trend where people have been saying well now how do i get the closed loop feedback because it's important right now well it was always important it's just you're noticing it now because you need to be able to respond to these customer issues as they happen because people will stop going to your location just because you didn't have the hand sanitizer in the front or you were out of the little cart wipes or things like that. And I think one of the uh, my favorite examples, and I, I won't name the rental car company, but for about three years, I traveled back and forth to Seattle weekly and use the same rental car company. Uh, one time had a bad experience. I actually filled out the survey. It was, you know, I'd seen the survey many times, so I didn't feel compelled most of the time to fill it out, but filled out the survey, got, I mean, no sooner than two minutes after I had filled it out, I got this little automated email. We're sorry you had a bad experience. Here's $25 that you can apply to your next rental. Um, for the next hundred weeks, I would say, I filled out a negative survey response every time <laughs> just to see what would happen. Just, I mean, I, I'm clearly a, a top tier customer for this company. Oh yeah. And every week I'm filling the thing out and getting just this automated $25 coupon. Now, if I had used them, I probably could have made, you know, free rentals for life, uh, thanks to my company. But at the same time, no one ever looked at it and said, you know, we should pick up the phone and find out what the problem is. Uh, so that, you know, it's not enough just to have an alert and it's not just enough to say, okay, we sent a coupon, everything's fine, we're sure. I mean, there should be a continuous cycle of feedback. And I, I think those are some of the research expectations that. You know, we really need to adjust to in this world. Um, you know, there are certain things, I mentioned it before when we were talking about contactless research, that's gonna be important. Um, one of my favorite things, um, Dan has really brought together uh, focus groups in a way that we've never seen them before using communities in Zoom. I mean, that's gonna be the reality short and probably medium term. I mean, so what's, you know, what are some of the next things we have to prepare for? You know, mobile plays strong into all this as well. Um, you know, we, we were talking earlier uh, in your in your AMA about mobile first design. And you know, I don't know if you know, I created the Mobile Research Association about a decade ago to address things like privacy, things like, um, you know, participation, what do you get and how can you turn things on or off, right? Um, for me, I'm a qualitative researcher from, from day one. I mean, I've been, that's where my heart is. 
I love getting underneath what the meaning is, you know, the, the, the iceberg, not just the tip. And um, I, I've been doing online focus groups forever. I think what's happening now is there's been a, a certain um, commoditization or democratization, if you will, of video platforms. Um, you can do it on your phone with Facebook. Yeah, there's tons of ways to have video conversations now on your watch, <laughs> whatever. Uh, having the biggest challenge I've had as a qualitative researcher doing experience work, and most qualitative is geared towards the future. You're gearing it towards fixing something or creating something. So you do observational mobile ethnographies. You can do um, all types of interviews, be it IDIs or, or duos or quads or up to five, six people on, on a Zoom, no problem. Um, the, the key is sorting through all that stuff. You get inundated with photos and videos. You get inundated with comments. If you ask a bunch of questions and you've got, if and for whatever reason you want to have 100 people participate, prepare to be flooded with data. And that's where having the tools for something like Question Pro to take open-ended comments and take things like that and quickly cipher them out. What is the big issue that they're, they're having a problem with? And be able to go and repair that. Um, and it has to be done at a basis at, at the point level of things like, um, uh, when you have things like a, uh, uh, how do I describe it? I guess it would be um, uh, customer listening posts. Just like the bathroom is a customer listing post with that little device on the wall, where else can customers actually give their point of view while they're on journey? Phone is the key, you know, because that's with them. It's become the second brain for everyone. So how can we get through to that and make it easy for them to do bing, 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 I've given you my input. Maybe voice talking into it's easier. Uh, sending video clips is certainly uh, one way to do it, but speed of delivery is is huge focus groups and, and and all the qualitative can take a little more time but the key there is is involving the design team that's going to make the changes whether they're in ux or architecture or product development whatever that is they need to be engaged in understanding how we're getting the information of what people are wanting to do and i i think you brought up something uh, very important there uh, in terms of individualization. And I, I think too often we take take for granted the numbers. Um, I mean, we have dashboards, um, you know, they're important to be able to communicate the results quickly, instantly. The speed to insight is so important. Uh, I, I wanna credit that to Nate because he brought it up, but um, it is important to have that speed to insight, but it's also important to remember, just like in my case, these are individual customers. These are individuals that have taken time to give feedback. Don't treat them as just an aggregate group. Um, you mentioned qual. Qual is so important because you, you know, whether it's a single open-end comment or a focus group or ethnographic research, they're taking the time to tell you a little bit about themselves so you can serve them better. Don't just take that information and reject it and say, okay, well, we, we already knew our approach. You just validated it kind of thing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, bringing up the voice aspect of stuff too. There, I think there's a lot of future in voice activated stuff. I, you know, when I was when I got my first uh, uh, Alexa device, I was kind of skeptical, and here she's waking up. Uh, but but I find myself talking to her more because I'm home alone all the time. I'm like, you know, play. I don't want to do it. I'm like play, you know, whatever radio or, or music or answer a question about the weather. Come on, play Desperado. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, I think voice is going to be a way. Did I, did I wake up? Someone else is there too. Um, yeah, it happens every time there's a commercial. But you know, I think that if we've got the idea for for what's next going on, if you look at things like mobile and you look at things like um, voice activation um, and video, you know, how can you how can they bring that information back to the decision makers that need to make a, a change? Some stuff requires immediate. Okay. If it's and it's like you want to you want to have a vent for people saying, hey, fire, I, I, this is awful, you know, and that's got to be corrected. Other things take time to sort through what are the behaviors we're needing to change and how do we do it? Right. That's that's a whole different question than how did I do on a scale of one, you know, nine to ten. Now, one more point, and you, you made it in this uh, in this introduction here. 
as a as a lifelong researcher for many many decades we could not possibly do anything that was not in aggregate it was just against the rules of our own rules to identify an individual yeah. now we have you know the, the gndp or whatever it is over in europe and california identifying people is more um sensitive but with cx research by nature it is to the individual level especially if you're going to blend in uh, management and operational data so that way you know this person does this 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 and this this is what they're feeling this is what they're thinking heck i've seen places that can cipher how they're talking and and then point them to the right uh, representative in a call center just by mm -hmm. stress of their voice so uh, those things coming together mobile vocal uh, and knowing that you're going to be dealing with a lot of data, hitting the touch point at the right time is key. Yeah, I want to pivot for one more thing here. Um, I'm going to change topic completely on you here mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I want to make sure. I mean, training has been part of, uh, I think you and I would say training was sort of on the job. You mentioned your first study. And you just sort of threw a survey out there and I'm probably not too far from that. I, at least I had a mentor to help me along the way, but even back then it wasn't even called CX research at that point. So um, Carl's on the line, Carl that has moved all his training online. He used to be in person, things like that. So um, this is the first time I've gone an entire year and it will be the whole year where I didn't intend uh, an in-person conference. Um, and, and I'm sure there will be a day when we attend. And um, so, you know, today's event, all online, short term, it will be virtual. Um, so I understand that you have something to announce as well. Oh, yes, I do. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, I took my time. We were all shocked, of course, when everything shut down, Every, the whole industry, everybody around the world was. and. I, I started signing up and I thought, okay, immediately, maybe I'll just put our conference the way it was online. That's easy to do. It, it, it's, not, it, it's not impossible. That's what all conference organizers have been doing that I've seen. And some are getting more experimental doing other things. Um, you might have someone talking on LinkedIn that's just doing their own thing, uh, just bringing up a subject. Um, and that's been great to get video on LinkedIn. It's wonderful. We didn't have that before. Um, and then to have things like um, across live streams, all the different uh, areas to go. So I started studying this and I said, okay, everyone's moving their stuff online in a two or three day multi-track you know, thing and it's all free. So that was another thing. No one's charging online for things. They're starting to get there with certain content. Certainly workshops are valuable, but even like this event is free. There's some valuable content here. Hopefully after this, we'll come out with a, a note that says, here's what we learned about blah, 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 you know, summary on it. But the thing is, is I learned that there was a, a kind of a missing niche and I ran a survey on it. The missing niche was, what do we do? How can we get back together again in person? What's that going to look like and when? And then the other question was, what kind of meeting would you want to have online? It's especially, and I've, I've asked this several times, like, you know, are you zoomed out? Yeah, everyone zoomed out. But what kind of meeting would you like? So I took those those two thoughts and I said, well, we've always been champs of short attention span presentations. Our presentations rarely are more than 15 minutes. We started off with 10 minutes, and but we figured 15 is about right. So short attention span on the web is number one. Number two, when we meet again, it has to be in a place that is secure, that, that is comfortable for everyone. And it provides a, um, you have to have, you have to have local regulations have to allow you to be there. And I found a place that is a music venue actually that can accommodate this stuff because they already have seating, they have stage, they have AV, they have control over all of the different safety measures that they're dealing with. And they have a restaurant and they have eight locations. So we're, we're looking at two things now, name change for me is I'm going forward with CX forums as our key brand forums to me. Um, it, it means actually, it literally means a place to share ideas and concepts and discuss talks. On the other hand, is going to continue. 
Um, and and uh, it's going to be continued as a brand, but it's going to be managed by um, Carlos Pimenta. And, and he's going to be doing other things with that. But what I want to do with forums is particularly bring more discussion time for people, more time for people to meet each other. Like this has been a great open discussion here, but still it's just two of us talking, right? Having networking ability online is key. So I've, I've actually about ready to launch it, been sitting on the sidelines a long time, studying and doing surveys on this. What I've landed on is to do a Connect Next live show weekly on Wednesdays, 1.30, have a 15 minute presentation, followed by 30 minutes of networking, group networking that you can get in breakout rooms. Every Wednesday you come live, you're gonna meet at least eight to 10 people new. And it, you're gonna learn something too. Short attention span theater, one hour a week. The second thing is, is with our events, we're looking at 10 markets next year these are going to be a little more high level. If you've ever been to a CX Talks event, um, everyone's there and it was fairly low cost. Um, because we can't have large meetings, and I don't think we're going to be at that point for a while, our, we've always been the local event planners. We go to Dallas, we go to Chicago, we were going to go to Seattle, and we're based in Atlanta. Um, our plan is to go to 10 markets with a shorter presentation instead of it being from you know eight in the morning till six at night it's going to go from nine until three registration early drinks afterwards if you'd like but the idea is is we want to elevate this a little bit more bring the show to you in your hometown so we're looking at 10 major markets next year all of them are on our website we're still updating things on our website but uh, it's active if anyone wants to go there, you can see those are, it's under cxforums.org. You can see those dates. You can apply to be a speaker. Uh, if someone's interested in sponsorship, you can do that as well. Um, the site is still under construction, but it is functional at this point. And I will say, I, I for one, am certainly looking forward to uh, the first one where we can do it in person again. <laughs> so, oh, yes. Um, everyone wants to in person. And Question Pro is proud to be sponsoring this as well, so we're, we're, we're a very Absolutely. proud sponsor. And we uh, we appreciate your your participation. Um, we are we are upgrading it quite a bit. We're going to call it the symposium. So a symposium is quite different from a uh, just a conference. Uh, it's, it's it's more of a uh, delegate get to talk together, sharing ideas, and and really uh, being uh, being together. You know, for a day is share the brain power. I think brains are like batteries. You get them together in the same area and they can generate more power. Um, I'm going to leave you with this one quote that I love uh, from uh, Megatrends um, a long time ago. High tech, high touch is a formula that's used to describe the way we, we respond to technology. And what happens is that whenever new technology is introduced into a society, there must be a counterbalancing human response that is high touch or the technology is rejected. The more high tech, the more people crave high touch. That was in 1982 that that, that was proposed and, and said that way. Um, the other quote I love when it comes to CX is, we shape our houses, then they shape us. And that is a note uh, from, from Winston Churchill. My two favorite quotes as they apply today. <laughs> Well, Mark, thank you for joining us. I, I hope you're sticking around for our uh, our product showcase, but uh, appreciate it. And again, Vivek has uh, put the new link uh, in the chat box if you want to check it out. And uh, we look forward to that. Thank you much. Right, with that, uh, we're going to move right into our product showcase. Um, we've been talking about this uh, probably for the last half of the year about advancing research. Uh, Hopefully my screen's up there. All right. Awesome when it works out right. Um, we're talking about advancing research. And again, similar to our other forums, um, make this interactive. Um, raise your hands, ask questions in chat, ask questions uh, by raising your hand, and we're happy to take them live. Uh, you're probably familiar with the two people presenting at this point, so I don't know if it's necessary to go too deep into our introductions. Uh, but... <clears throat> I am going to share a quote. Um, it's my quote. And uh, Anup said this should be our feature quote for CX, uh, especially when it comes to NPS plus. Passives are the forgotten middle child of the NPS model. Um, 
I, I sort of made that quote jokingly um, a couple of months ago when we were talking about NPS plus and Anup grabbed onto it and said, this should be everywhere. This should be everything about NPS and NPS plus. And uh, so we, you know, you know, it's sort of the why behind the NPS plus and really um, Vivek and I are going to talk about that in a, in a lot of detail today. We'll, we'll, we'll walk you through some of the uh, some of what it looks like, but really it, it, it's a lot more about the why, which is we wanted to shorten and simplify. I mean, you've, you've heard a lot uh, during our open mic um, with what Mark and I were talking about, you know, making the, uh, the, the customer experience experience survey a better experience, uh, to put it very simply. Um, so it's really not, uh, I mean, surveys, I don't think you could go out and spend a day uh, doing your normal stuff that you do without getting five to 10 invites to a survey. I mean, just, just take a look at, you know, you go to a restaurant, you go to the grocery store, you stop at the pharmacy. I mean, all these things that you do, you're, you're getting an invitation to, to conduct a survey. And certainly um, it's important to get that uh, feedback from customers when you can. But at the same time, you need to make that experience a little easier. So what we put together is a model that really provides an immediate link to root cause, allows you to identify those that might be at risk at churn. I mean, I think we accept um, that detractors are risk of churn, uh, but you know there, there are passives that are at risk of churn as well. And, and that's what we wanted to get at. And I think the other part, and um, Vivek's contribution on this just made it, I mean, it, it just closed it up for us. That idea that you can get your customers to innovate and co-create with you. Be able to not just ask the question, but have others look at those responses, um, not just internally, but externally and say, you know, what, it, you know, what is important about it. So uh, we say, you know, NPS Plus will change your approach to the transactional customer experience. It will change your approach to the relationship customer experience. Uh, but it's it's going to shorten the survey. It's going to keep to that original NPS promise from, I think you had it right, 2003, I think it was in HBR. Um, it's going to remove, <laughs> sorry, matrix questions are the most redundant, boring, and useless tools out there. And we all are guilty of it. We all are guilty of putting tw 20 attributes, as we call them, and then saying, oh, we're going to match attribute, and we're going to, you know, we're going to be able to create an importance performance chart and the reality is they're boring and they're probably not very accurate because as soon as you see them, you sort of go, they doze off a little bit. And then beyond detractors, the other key benefit, like I said, is really getting a better understanding of passives, not leaving them out of the equation. And they're often left out because it's either, well, we want to move um, people into promoters or we want to move people out of detractors. But there is that group of passives and often they're the largest group um, in a lot of research where you know, there's something to do with them. And if you're not paying attention to them, you're gonna lose as a business. So what is NPS plus? Um, well, it's a three-step process, essentially. It's, it's pulling together the traditional NPS question, the scale of zero to 10, you know, the options that you're, you're used to. Uh, but the, the two things that we've added onto it is once you choose your rating, you get to choose a root cause. A singular, you can, you know, when you're talking about the matrix of questions, these are the things that you need to put in there. This, you, you ask them to choose which one is the one that stands out to you. What's most important? Make them force a choice. I mean, we were talking in the previous session about the thumbs up and thumbs down and, oh, what if there's a middle choice? Well, no, not a middle choice. If something bothers you, tell us what it is that was bothering you. The thing that stood out the most, was it the service? Was it the cleanliness? And being able to bring that together, it, with the open-end question, where once they answer that open-end question, let them vote on other open-end questions. Customer enters their comments and then they get to vote. And we'll show you some screens of that. And you know, it really creates a smooth user experience. Uh, it really is enhanced for mobile devices, which 65% of surveys uh, for customer experience are being done on mobile devices. So it really is gonna enhance that make it a smoother experience, shorten the survey, and um, really, uh, I think it's advancing research, particularly CX research, in a way that hasn't been thought about in years. And it, it's gonna enable us to now focus on what we're, what we're going to react to, what we can predict with churn, as well as now 
take that analytics a step further because now we can really focus on bringing in those sources of data rather than relying on let's add another measure because that's how we're going to get answer the questions for our customers. Anything you want to add? No, I no, think I think, I think about the color. color. So let me uh, walk through, um, I'm gonna walk through a couple of steps here. I'm gonna show you what the survey editor looks like. Very simple, very compact, easy to use as a CX researcher. Uh, even if you don't have a lot of CX experience, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but um, I am here to answer those questions. So if you decide that you wanna launch this within your Question Pro platform, I am happy to help you walk you along that path. As we talked about earlier with CX design and being able to think about what your goals are for the research. The next thing is I'll show you sort of what it looks like in the survey experience, and then finally wrap up with some of the reporting tools that we use along with it. So it is traditional, it's a question within our question set. If you're at all familiar with the Question Pro platform, the customer experience platform, as you're building a survey, you can just add that question and NPS plus is a question type. From there, you're able to customize the text of the question but also as you hover over uh, the numbers here, it will show a, a, a statement for <laughs> that response. So you can actually customize what it says if you're hovering over detractors. Are you likely to recommend? Not at all. Are you uh, a passive? When you hover over seven and eight, I'm not sure if I'm gonna recommend. And then nine and 10, of course. And you can actually customize that text within there. From there, you'll add in the root causes. and. It's not as if you have to um, take a whole lot away from what you're doing. We call it the augment. It is augmenting what you're doing. Get rid of all the attributes, start adding in things such as cleanliness, such as service, where you can get down and you can actually action on it. Um, what, what action do you take on a seven for cleanliness? I don't know, that's a tough one in this environment. Seven might be you're doing terrible because it's not a 10. Um, at the same time, someone else responding to a seven might be just, you know, might be happy with what it is. Um, seven might be, they just wear out of hand sanitizer for all I know. So being able to get down to that, um, you know, where can we improve what went wrong and also what went well. So when you have the happy customers, you're identifying the things that really stand out for them. Of course, as I mentioned, there is the, uh, the one comment and then there's a little tab down there at the bottom that says voting. You turn on that. And the whole point of that, as you'll see, is to allow customers to look at other comments and say, this is a good idea. This is something that should be brought forward. Even though I didn't make that comment, hey, I like that comment. So let me show you the survey experience so that you can get a little more flavor for that. Obviously, as you ask the question, um, pretty standard, typical of what you see. But then the root causes came up. What can you, you know, what can you expect there? What went wrong? We're, we try to push it to just one response. What's the one thing that stands out? Make that, make them choose, make them commit to a reason behind it. Of course, next slide is the open end comment, as I mentioned. And then my favorite part, as soon as you answer that open end comment, you'll see a list of everyone else's comments uh, for that time period that you've specified. And so that gives them an opportunity to now vote on it. And this, this re idea really comes out of communities uh, where you have, um, whether it's communities or discussion boards or discussion forums, you're able to then go in and look at what other people saying. And it's sort of giving up the thumbs up, thumbs down approach to it and saying, hey, I wanna vote three times on this particular comment because I really like what they have to say. So if I, if I went in and finished a survey and I said, you know, I, I think it'd be great if you uh, layered the tables with plastic between each customer. I mean, that seems relevant in this day and age. It might not be something that you're thinking of. It's a cleanliness issue. It might not, it might not be a deal breaker for anyone because I don't know of anyone doing it, but suddenly a bunch of people are voting on it. You know a way to really make people feel comfortable with it. So they could go in and vote on it and others could go in and vote on it. They could give it one vote or five votes. But the idea being that you can allocate multiple votes across the different comments that you see and be able to really push a topic to the top of the leadership that they can think about and make the approach for it. And I think that's probably one of the most powerful items in this, um, in this approach is because you're, you're not just 
pushing out more open-end comments, you're actually getting your customers to scrutinize the comments, which is amazing when you think about it, because I think back to when we initially uh, were coding open-end comments, it was a manual task where we sat there and typed two, seven, nine, 11, just depending on what the comment was about. And then suddenly you realize, well, we might have to have two fields for each comment because <laughs> multiple topics come up. This, this really takes it to a different place, even beyond uh, what the AI can do. It's, it's our customers uh, giving us the intelligence. So we'll call it CI, customer intelligence. Um, so that really touches on the innovation and co-creation part and the simplification. One of the things that uh, I don't want to leave out, and, and we're going to get to it when we talk about the reporting widget, um, is the churn risk. And that, that's another key. I mean, we, we had a question earlier during our CX op open mic about return on investment, and this is that key area. So first of all, again, if you're familiar with our platform, very easy to get this widget. Um, it's an all-in-one compacted widget. There are some settings where you can show some things, hide some things, but it's, it's all there so you can see it all at once. You add it to your dashboard and voila, there it is. It looks just like that. You're able to see your NPS score, you're able to see the NPS trend against the score as well. Uh, and then down below we have the root causes and you can see the root cause for that current time period, uh, but you can also, as you see it here, but you can also see trended root cause as well. So you understand if you're making improvements in certain areas, if you're seeing declines, that could mean uh, declines mean you're poor, performing poorly, or if it's a decline in uh, the, the promoters that are saying it, other topics become more important. I mean, I, I, would, I would guess that between February and March, cleanliness of your location went from an almost unthought of topic to probably one of the most important topics uh, on customers' minds. So being able to watch these trends and even break down these trends to see where the responses are coming from. And then further dive into, for those root causes, what, what are the individual customers saying? And Mark and I were talking about this a little bit before, and Carl also had some inputs on this as well, in which we were saying, you know, it, it isn't just about aggregating the data, it's about getting back to an individual customer and understanding what their individual needs are. Uh, particularly if your customer base is limited. It's one thing if you have a supermarket and within that supermarket, you have thousands of customers. If you lost one customer, you'd probably shrug your shoulders and go, oh, they didn't wanna be here anyway. Uh, but if you were a B2B SaaS firm and you have 40 total customers, the loss of one customer is huge. So being able to interact with them in that way and not just treat them as another data point in your survey is very important. And that leads us into the turn risk. Um, I, I started this by talking about the forgotten middle child and um, may, maybe it's personal to me because I'm a middle child. So, um, but you know, I, I think we recognize that detractors are a risk of turn but that forgotten middle child is never analyzed. And so what we take with those root causes, you can actually start to identify which passive customers are having the same issues that your detractors are having. And when they're having those same issues, chances are they're going to move pretty quickly uh, to detractors if you don't change that root cause. If you, if, again, if we're talking about cleanliness and they're passive now, they might be passive because Hey, they like you. Hey, they'll shop here, you know, but the store cleanliness could have used some work, but if it continues that way, that's going to be the thing that drives them out. That's going to be the thing that causes that churn risk. Uh, so we're now able to identify who those are and passives are usually a big part of that group. I mean, if you look at most NPS scores, it's not all hundreds. It's all, it's not all negative 100s chances are you're probably sitting there between a 33 and a 67, and there's probably about 25 to 40% of your customers are sitting in that passive category, if not more. Um, so it gives us the ability to look at them in detail, figure out who's at risk, and actually apply a, a value to it. So when you start looking at your NPS, NPS is a, a great, um, call it looking backwards indicator, as we were talking about, you know, being able to sit, look in the past and say, well, hey, we had a 67 NPS this time around and it was, you know, this many promoters and this many detractors. This is looking forward and saying, you know, if you're um, 
you're looking at your business in the future, you have 30% of your customers that might be at risk of turning. And that's that's got real financial implications, obviously. And then of course, because it is a customer experience platform, you're able to really dig into some of the details and about the individual customers. Find those that are at risk, not just as detractors, but also as passives. Get into what is the root cause. I mean, you can see that here on the column on the right. And then even dig further into their other service they may have uh, responded to uh, within our platform and uh, really get into the details like you've never seen it before. And all of this is coming out of basically one question set, uh, ultimately. And so when we talk about the survey experience and the survey experience experience, <laughs> um, being able to bring that down, narrow it, make it easy. Um, we've been we've been trying it out and it's tested out really, really well and really happy to provide additional information. We, we wrote some extensive uh, research on this topic in which, of course, I had to include the uh, quote that Anup found so compelling about being a middle child. Uh, but uh, hopefully that sort of gives you a flavor of some of the things that we're doing to innovate, advance research, particularly advancing uh, customer experience research. And I wanted to make sure I left a couple of minutes uh, to answer any questions. I, I know the chat box has been uh, moving, so let me uh, open it up. Uh, Viv, did you see anything in there? Yeah, let's just open it up for questions. Um, can you, uh, you know, uh, anybody who's got any have have any questions? I just want to kind of touch on that churn risk model uh, one more time. Um, the, the, our like a, the fundamental thesis behind the churn risk modeling is the root cause for passives versus root causes for detractors. Um, we we look at that and we analyze like where the root causes are the same. So very likely the basic thesis is that very likely that folks who are who are you know who who say they are passives, but are annoyed about you for the same reasons as much as the detractors are annoyed about you. So that's kind of the fundamental kind of kind of systemic thesis behind that. Um, and we use that as a basis for determining the churn risk effectively. Um, so within that's how we've kind of got computed the churn risk modeling to say, you know, if you are if you are a detractor because you know you know uh, the bathrooms are not great. A passive who also thinks that the bathrooms are not great is likely going to be a detractor going forward. Uh, so that is the kind of underlying principle um, that we are applying for the churn risk modeling, um, and that you know, and and we are we and we've tested that, and we are actually pilot testing with a couple other customers, and to see you know to kind of validate that theory, obviously. Uh, and so that has been a, a separate ongoing project that we are working on with a couple of our customers. Um, and so uh, and and that's kind of like we think that that kind of without going into like a completely different kind of model around churn risk, we can just apply the kind of data that we have um, using NPS and the kind of the root cause analysis to kind of determine churn effectively. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to kind of clarify that on a, on, a, on a kind of granular level. I know I'm going into the weeds over here, but kind of, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are a couple of wonks in the, in the, in the, in the group. I know that. Um, so I think, you know, it's for them that I want to kind of make sure that that's there. 